This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. The Wharton School is leveling up its teaching and its research in the areas of artificial intelligence and data science. The school has launched the Wharton AI and Analytics Initiative. It's an interdisciplinary collaborative effort to shape how generative AI will be used for business innovation and beyond. Welcome to Knowledge at Wharton. I'm Angie Bastioni. With me today is Eric Bradlow. He's a longtime faculty member in our marketing department. He's an applied statistician, and many of you probably know him from his Moneyball podcast on SiriusXM. Eric, thanks for being with me. Oh, it's great to be here, Angie, and always happy to talk about our new acronym, WAIAI. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, you've been named as the new vice dean for this initiative, so you're giving us a little bit of time today to pick your brain about it. I want to start with asking you to explain just a quick overview of the initiative and why the school is launching it right now. Yeah, I mean, it's really, as our Dean Erica James says, it's really one of those meet the moment types of opportunities for the Wharton School. Um, actually, we've been in the analytics business, if you'd like, for 20 years. Uh, a colleague of mine, Pete Fader, and I started the first ever data science center, if you'd like, at any business school in the world 20 years ago now. And so we always believe that data science, basically using empiricism, using high powered statistical models, was going to be a big part of the future of business because of technology and new data streams that emerge. But what's happened, of course, in the last almost two years now is generative AI. Now, fortunately at Wharton, we've had a center called AI at Wharton for almost seven years now. We knew this future was coming. We didn't know how fast and how, if you like, ubiquitous it was going to be. But the goals of our center are actually quite simple. There are four major goals. First, we want to be thought of as the number one knowledge creators of business schools in the world. Number two, we want to impact students. Now, broadly defined, not just students at the Wharton School or even the University of Pennsylvania, but we want to democratize AI and business education throughout the world. Third, we want to have an impact on the C-suite. We're a business school. And so what I always say is we're training people to be the leaders in AI and data science, but not data scientists. We're training people to lead companies through AI and data science. And last but not least, I've always called it analytics for good, but how about we do some good in the world through data science? So those are our four, if you'd like, populations of interest, if you'd like, researchers, students, companies, and the community, and now's the time to have that impact. I love that. Let's talk about a couple of those buckets. Let's start with number two, which you mentioned students. Now, this initiative, you've got this really unique collaboration with OpenAI. Most of us know that name by now because they're the makers of ChatGPT. So starting in the fall, our MBA students are going to have these creative enterprise licenses with ChatGPT. What do those licenses do? What are they going to create with them? What's the end result? Yeah. So first, let me just say why I think this is crucially important. And let me just say, as you can imagine, there's more sensitivities on younger adults, meaning the undergraduate population. But that's coming, by the way. There will be a time where Wharton will be able to present enterprise licenses to the entire population. But of course, the undergraduate is as part of the University of Pennsylvania. So there's some technicalities there, but we're working through them. The, the answer is, Angie, you learn AI by doing it. Right. So that's the only way to get people to do it. Every Wharton for now MBA, every faculty member, every PhD student will have access to, if you'd like, the newest versions as they come of ChatGPT right on their desktop or phone. They can actually experiment with it, see what it can do to enhance their education. We don't view it as replacing us as faculty. We view it as enhancing their education. And at the end of the day, this is what it's going to be expected of all of our students when they go into the workforce. They're going to be expected to know, so how do I create video using artificial intelligence? How do I do the proper prompt engineering so that I can get the right answers out of these large language model engines like ChatGPT? And the only way to do it is to experience it. And that's what these licenses are going to provide. And the good news about the enterprise version is the data is secure. What I mean by that is if Eric Bradlow, myself, Professor Bradlow, uploads his course materials and creates a localized version of ChatGPT, it's not being sucked up into the corpus that they're using to train the model. So people around the world do not have access to my information. And let's be honest, Angie, 
that's the business model because chat GPT for most people is free. Forget the enterprise, mm-hmm. it's free. It's like Google. Google search is free to you and me, but it's not right. free to companies that want to advertise on it. Chat GPT is free to you and me, but it's not free to Amazon that wants to create a localized version of it. So that's the way it's going to work. We, Wharton, have invested money and resources in an enterprise license so we can educate our students on how to be leaders through using artificial intelligence. I hope one of them comes up with the next big idea. We'll stay tuned about that. I do too. Well, there's so much research that's coming out of Wharton about AI. Uh, can you give us like a quick touch on some of the areas that have already been impacted by our research and then what you find to be the most promising? Yeah, I think research comes in a few different buckets. Mm-hmm. So one of the buckets are there are people, even though we're a business school, there are people at Wharton that are statisticians and computer scientists like myself who we do work on the actual, let's call it the mathematical models that underlie artificial intelligence. And just so all of our listeners know, AI has been around for about 60 years. So as a PhD student, I learned about artificial intelligence. Now, large language models, which is taking a big corpus of information training them in real time at scale and providing generative AI, that's new. But the problem of predicting the next word or token that's going to be used, that's that's not a new problem. But number one, there's academics who are in my narrow slice, mm-hmm. who are what we call methodologists that will work on the methods. The larger bucket, the much larger bucket for researchers are people that are going to apply AI. So for example, how do you use pay? Uh, patient records. I'm in the healthcare management department here at the Wharton School. I partner with Penn Medicine. I see doctors writing handwritten notes on patient records. Well, those used to have to be human coded. Now they don't. I'm in the management department. I want to know how AI is going to affect teamwork and how it's going to affect, like if I can just ask a chat agent and not my colleague, well, what does that do to camaraderie and building relationships with your team? And so there's researchers, many of us, that also work on applications of artificial intelligence. And then of course, there's the student piece, which is, you know, how do I get my job done? How do I get my job as a student done using artificial intelligence? So I view us almost like as a three-pronged, at least three-pronged laboratory, which is the methods part, the applications part, and the how do I get it done part with artificial intelligence. You know, I have been learning so much about AI just from coverage at Wharton, and there really is no area that it doesn't touch. There really isn't. And I think one of the things that's really um, great about the school is that our professors are always trying to pursue relevant research, research that has a business case, a use case. Can you tell me uh, what the companies are asking us for right now? What is it that they want in terms of AI research? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of it. So let me just give you a couple of specific use cases. So obviously, one big area is in customer service. So for example, can AI be used for chatbots? And what's mm-hmm. people's reaction to the use of AI-generated chatbots? Can AI be used to coordinate or collect, you know, let's call it audio recordings and video recordings, make them searchable? indexable so that in some sense, we don't need humans taking notes, the AI engine can do it. The third part is what most companies are interested in is they have data all over the company. And I say data, I don't mean just numeric data, which is historically how we thought about it, but I have physical reports. I have online reports. I've got Excel spreadsheets. I've got PowerPoint decks. I've got a SQL database. I've got a big data lake sitting somewhere. How do I bring all of that information together So Angie sitting at her desk doesn't need to be a programmer to query this database, can just use the English language or even a foreign language to just query this database and say, what do we know about the following topic? If we were to make an investment in X, what does our data say about this? Or Angie has a data set. You're not a, you don't know Python, but you want to do some analysis. Well, you can now do that analysis. So I think of it as, are there jobs that will be replaced? Absolutely. Are there, but that's not to me the large part. The large part is how does each person use AI in their job? As my colleague Stefano Puntoni says, and my colleague Ethan Malik say, it's AI and the workforce, not AI or the workforce. Right. So that's what I see as the biggest, most exciting use cases. And that's something I, you know, I think is really important to touch on too, because 
AI has been described as everything from society's salvation to its doom, right? It just sort of depends on where you sit on the spectrum. As a communications person, I think I lean more towards the doom part. <laughs> but tell me, I tell me where you sit. You know, what, what gives you optimism about AI and what do you worry about? Yeah, so um, I actually, given we have a political election here in the U.S. in 2024, my worries are more on a personal level, which is around disinformation. And, you know, if you like creating fake content, which is almost indistinguishable, if not totally indistinguishable from real content, I'm worried about, um, I was actually at a conference just yesterday in San Francisco or two days ago, I took a red eye back. Um, and this was someone from one of the large security companies in the world and says, imagine the following, imagine you create a million fake articles and load them into ChatGPT. Well, it's going to train on those fake articles. And then to anybody using ChatGPT, it's going to seem like the truth. So the disinformation and the fact is sometimes, as you know, they, they call them fakes. It just makes stuff up. It will give you an answer. So that concerns me in a society that's got some polarization in it and a society where we're relying on these engines to provide us answers. And my view is relying is the wrong word. We shouldn't be relying on them. They should be decision support tools. But I can mm -hmm. promise you, I'm not betting my company's future or my academic future or my teaching future or my research future on what an AI engine says, because I know I test it all the time. Some of it stuff it says is just wrong. It seems right, but it's actually wrong. So my concerns are around disinformation. I've look, I everybody's I love action movies. I've seen every Schwarzenegger Terminator movie. <laughs> I'm not worried about AI, cyber, whatever they called it, cyber, whatever the name of the thing was in, in the Terminator movies. I'm not worried about AI taking over all of that. Robot replacement. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not worried about that. But I do think, and I'll tell you what else I'm worried about. I'm worried about people, I'm not worried about the young people today because they always get trained in the best of technology and we have to democratize that. We need to do a better job of making access available. I'm worried about the 50 plus year old, I'm pointing at myself, <laughs> Same. who need to be training <laughs> mm -hmm. because of what AI can do and where do they go. So I'm worried that the people whose jobs will be displaced, many of them don't have the training or won't receive the training to make AI an asset for them, it'll be seen as taking over their job. So those, if you ask me my areas of concern, it's, I'll call it disinformation. Mm -hmm. And it's also that um, in some sense, the people that are going to benefit the most from it are the people that are the young people who are going to get training. But what about the 40, 50, 60, 70 plus year olds in the workforce that will need this type of training? Where are they going to go to get it? Right. And they already face a certain degree of age discrimination in general. So this might further set them back in the workforce. Well, let's not end on a, on a tough note. Let's end on a positive note. What gives you optimism about AI for the future and about this initiative? Well, I, I think I hope this is what everybody does. And my, my colleague Ethan Mollick says this the best. Just go on and start using it. Like, mm -hmm. think about all the things you do. So I'll give you an example. I'll just take an example. Matter of fact, our, our interim president, Larry Jamison, asked me to speak on this to a group of, uh, if you'd like, alumni, maybe about two weeks ago, the role of AI in education. And I said, okay. So I used to need, I still do, I could use them, but I don't need them, physical TAs in the classroom to sit there and record class participation. Well, I don't need that. I have audio data. Well, I needed people to help me do grading. It's not obvious I need that anymore. Um, well, every year, oh, my God, i got to create an exam. No, I don't. ChatGPT can create an exam for me. Oh, I need to create a simulation for the class. Well, actually, um, the generative AI lab that Ethan and his wife, Lilak Malik, are starting can generate a simulation for me. So the way I view it is Wharton should be thrilled. Eric Bradlow gets to spend more time on research. He gets to spend more time teaching in a pedagogically interesting way. He gets to spend more time mentoring our students, but all this stuff that now can be, his time can be alleviated because he can get the generative AI engine to do it. He doesn't have to spend his time on anymore. So to me, I think this is, I think everybody, this is my fatherly advice to everybody here. Think about the tasks that you do and just do it. Before you do the tasks in the human-like manner you've been doing them till now, Try doing them in a generative AI engine, a large language model engine, see the results you get, 
and step by step, you'll notice in yourself, like I did, replacing the things that used to take me a ton of time, but weren't what I call the heavy brain human CPU stuff I'd like to spend my time on. That's what gets me excited. Yeah, that's something I have heard our professors uh, repeat quite often, which is think of think of it as a tool that can free you up from the banal so that you can do the more exciting aspects of the job that you love. So it sounds sounds good to me. Well, it sounds good to me, too. And <laughs> as I said, as you said at the beginning, um, Wharton AI and Analytics Initiative, you know, uh, we're extraordinarily ambitious. We want to impact the world. We want to impact society, businesses, researchers students, and we're going to do it. And and then real magic to it is through partnerships. So we're, we partner with schools to deliver education. We partner with nonprofits to teach nonprofits how to use them. Obviously, we partner with scholars around the world. We partner with companies in the C-suite. And so this, as a matter of fact, this is a time where the ivory tower better not be the ivory tower because we desperately need the application and the corporate partners to actually bring what we're doing to life. So again, I've never been more excited and I, I'm honored that our Dean asked me to lead this initiative. Congratulations to you. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Eric Bradlow is the new Vice Dean of Wharton's AI and Analytics Initiative. You can learn more about the initiative, sign up for updates, insights at their website, which is ai-analytics at wharton.upenn.edu. I'm going to say that one more time, ai-analytics at wharton.upenn.edu. For Knowledge at Wharton, I'm Angie Bassiani. Thanks for joining us. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.